Hello and welcome to the video. This is a video that may become part of a little series. If it does, I'll put a playlist down below. Specifically looking at how you choose a motor and a prop that go together for your particular fixed wing model. Now I did a video a while ago about how I cheat. By cheating, I really mean what I'll do is take what the manufacturer of that particular model recommends and nick that idea, or I will find a plane or fixed wing model in my existing collection it's a similar layout, weight, and look at what motor and prop is on the back of there. And I will copy that and put that on the new model if there isn't any other guidance. The challenge with this stuff is it tends to be a little bit iterative. Like with a Vorticon build that I did recently, I put a motor and prop on to try it out. And I was struggling with enough static thrust to get it launched into the air. So then we ended up doing some more static thrust testing because I wanted a system that would give more static thrust. And lots of you quite rightly commented on that video that static thrust doesn't equal speed and it doesn't they're actually mutually exclusive but that's one of the things i'm going to talk about with a gentleman in a minute and that is a real challenge when you're talking about motors and props it is a massive highly complex subject so any video is only going to be talking about a very small portion unless you wanted that video to be about six or seven days long so what I've been trying to do is get a number of kind of golden rules, rules of thumb, and try and talk with experts and illustrate those because there are tools that you can use. Uh, the one that we're going to be talking about today is something called eCalc. Now eCalc is a tool that I uh, used back in the day. It's now an entire suite of tools for lots of different things. And there's a free um unregistered access version which doesn't have all the detail in it all the motors and props are there but if you set yourself up an account then you can absolutely access the stuff and it is great for doing what ifs changing the prop and motor size putting in the kind of speed that you want or the static thrust and it will calculate out some recommendations for motors and props so it can get you an awful lot closer so I thought, brilliant, now we've got the tool, and um, thanks to some help from the gentleman I'm about to speak to, I know how to use eCalc a little bit more now, and the fact that I want to kind of explain some of these golden rules, let's see if we can use the two together to illustrate it so we don't have to create really complicated setups, because I don't have a wind tunnel that I can put the equipment into to kind of demonstrate some of this stuff. So I'm gonna hand over to myself in a moment, uh, and a gentleman called Marcus. Marcus Mueller is uh, behind the eCalc website and all of those great tools and the modeling that sits in there. Very knowledgeable chap. And when him and I were talking about this, he has some great insights. So let's go into the four questions that we're going to answer in this video. Time index is down below. And hopefully it will um, make you think a little bit more about some of the considerations and some of the golden rules when you're picking a motor and a prop. If you're already a motor and prop fixed wing expert, none of this is gonna be new to you at all. But if you're coming from the multi rotor part of the hobby and you're coming into fixed wing, uh, some of this might be news to you, or maybe you're just brand new to the hobby and you're trying to figure out how it all works. So let me hand over to the recorded Skype chat uh, and to myself and Marcus to go into a little bit more detail. Hello, and so here we are. This is Marcus. Hello, Marcus. Uh, thank you uh, for putting the time aside today. So uh, as I just said in the introduction, Marcus is the gentleman behind the eCalc website, and Marcus has very generously put aside a little bit of time uh, this morning for us to have a chat to cover these kind of golden rules. Again, if you have anything that you uh, like Marcus and I to kind of talk about, and if we can kind of show it in the eCalc tool, uh, that uh, would be great. Pop it down in the comments down below. Now, so what we're going to do, we'll just work through the list of questions, uh, well, golden rules, I think we're calling them, uh, that Marcus and I came up with for this very first video. So uh, first of all, I think the um, the big thing to talk about, and the number one, is that larger props are more efficient than smaller props. Now this is something that I've talked about ad infinitum on the channel, and I tend to go for uh, the larger props on my models with lower KVs, and that's more about efficiency. And I get lots of commentary about this um, and, and it's something that I think it's worthwhile talking about because if, you, if you've got the room for a larger prop and you want more efficiency it's usually worthwhile investigating that. Is this something that you get asked about as well or, or that we can show through the eCalc system? Yes, that's, uh, I get this question a lot of time and 
larger props are more efficient due to a uh, higher propeller area. This is one thing. The other thing is uh, you can turn the props lower to get the same thrust. So when you talk about efficiency regarding thrust to uh, power ratio, then a bigger prop is more efficient than a smaller one. Some things that a thing that I get asked about sometimes is regarding the the prop the, the tip speed. So the tip of the prop with larger props, um, but the issue with with the larger props is you're typically not spinning them as fast as the smaller ones. So you don't have that issue where you you know you're approaching Mach one at the tip of the prop, yeah. uh, particularly not with models anyway. So you don't tend to bump into that as well. Uh, we have here two examples with uh, two different prop diameters. Uh, with a 9 inch prop and a 10 inch prop. I little tweaked the uh, e calc to result the exact same uh, thrust from these uh, props. It's 1174 uh, uh, grams thrust. Yeah. And now we can see two, two effects. So the smaller prop turns with a higher RPM and it produces a higher pitch speed. And as you can see, the specific thrust, that's uh, the ratio between thrust and input power, is higher on the 10-inch prop on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side on the 9-inch. Yeah. So when we're looking at the grams per watt, the, the, the higher the number, the more efficient it is, the more grams per yes, watt we're getting. Correct. So we want a, the bigger number. So you, we can actually see that. that. That's a really good way to illustrate that and show that that is the case. Of course, some, some instances you can't swing the bigger prop because of space. Sometimes it's an issue of a scale model needing a particular type of prop. But if where you can, you know, using a slightly bigger prop uh, will typically be more efficient. Uh, one side effect on this uh, efficiency is the higher thrust you get, the more efficient your prop gets, but the slower the pitch speed gets. So this, this has the side effect that you have enough thrust to fly, but your airplane is kind of hanging in the air and not really flying. Yeah. And, and is always close to the uh, stall speed. So. So I think this is something we're going to talk about later about uh, static thrust versus uh, the actual speed you'll achieve with a model in the air. Because again, this is some, another one of these golden rules because you can't have both. And I think this is a common misconception. So uh, yeah, this is a great example and, and kind of a, a bit of a primer for, a, for an upcoming golden rule. Okay, the next one we'll talk about then is uh, one of my favorites is talking about the difference of two-bladed props versus three-bladed props and the fact that three-bladed props are less, e less efficient than two-bladed props, which is why I always try and use two-bladed props on my fixed-wing models and actually why I quite like two-bladed props on my multi-rotors as well if I can get away with it. Can we talk a little bit about why that is? Uh, one thing is uh, an additional blade adds more drag on the propeller so the pro uh, power constants you using for the propeller is less efficient. So you need more power to turn the same prop with three blades. That's one thing. Yeah, the power constant is the result of, of the drag itself. Right. So the drag is higher with an additional uh, blade mm -hmm. and, and therefore the efficiency is less than a two blade because the two blade equivalent adds only a little more drag and the additional blade adds much more drag. Yeah, I can show you an example, but uh, be aware that the power constant is not adjusted to the three blade in the following example. Yeah. Okay, on the left hand side we have an 11 inch propeller three bladed, on the right hand side we have a 12 inch two bladed propeller. Yep. So we go down to the results and as you can see we have uh, about the same amperage on both props. We have about the same thrust and about the same pitch speed. However, here looks like the specific thrust on the three bladed is uh, better, 
but this is only due to the fact we did not consider the correct p constants for this uh, propeller right and that's that's that power constant you talked about which a result of the extra drag etc means that it's less efficient at converting the power into thrust yes that's correct okay yeah viola viola is a two-bladed prop we have a, a constant of 109 and when we change to three blade then then it changes to 1.13 so so that that is the effect of adding more drag so the next question is one that uh i think a lot of people don't realize now i did a video a while ago where i talked it's on i'll link it here i did a video a while ago where i was doing static thrust testing on a bench and i was running props and comparing the static thrust that setup was producing against the tables that manufacturers produce and the reason that i was looking for an increased static thrust on my particular model was because I was struggling to hand launch it. So I needed a lot of static thrust because when you hand launch it, it's practically static air. You not, can't really throw it that hard. So I needed lots of push to get it into the air. Now, there was lots of comments on that, really good comments about, oh yeah, but that means it won't go very quick. And I, I want to talk about that here with Marcus because that's exactly the thing. There is two things that you can have you can either have lots of static thrust and low top speed on your model or you can have lower static thrust and higher top speed and i want to you know marcus for you to talk about in a minute about you know the variable pitch and how that happens and uh, the fact that you can get to extremes where having too aggressive a pitch on your prop so that you have a really fast model will mean that actually in static air the prop is stalling so you you lose an awful lot of the static thrust that you would get so the way that works is that you would actually and you can tell when a prop is stalling because it makes a horrible sound it sounds like the bearings have just exploded in your motor if if your motor makes that sound when you're holding it holding the model still in static air but then as soon as you start flying that sound goes away that is probably because your prop is stalling and you have a lot of pitch on your on your blades, which will give you a very fast model, but that's what's happening. Now, th this is something that that I think a lot of people don't understand, and they, and they equate a high thrust, a lots of air being pushed backwards in a static thrust test, to the model going really quickly when you throw it. Uh, but, you know, y y this is something that we talked about before, wasn't it, Marcus? Yes, that's correct. The... Uh main thing on this is on a given propeller size in diameter you can increase the the pitch so you, you can increase the pitch and then you get to a certain level when the prop starts to stall in static conditions and this is about 66 percent of the diameter when the pitch is uh, bigger than 66% of the diameter, the airflow over the blade tends to stall. You so, don't get the real uh, static thrust out of the propeller that would be possible for this power you you have. So, so let's talk a little bit of that because that's really interesting. So I, I like that as a golden rule. I like little golden rules like that. So so let's imagine we've got a 10 inch prop. If it's a six, if it's 10 by six, you're probably going to be okay you know it's probably going to produce all the thrust it can when at launch right yeah. if, if you go with a 10 inch prop with an 8 inch pitch that's probably going to stall in static air it's probably and, and you're going to get a lot less static thrust out of it um, and let's just look is it worthwhile talking maybe a little bit about why what stalling is and why it happens on a prop because again i think a lot of people don't think about props as little wings that turn in a circle yeah basically the propeller is nothing else than a little wing and the airflow enters the blade and has to follow the blade to unlock the full potential of the blade to produce uh, thrust. When you now increase the angle of attack, no, then you change the angle between the airflow and the blade. That means you increase the pitch, basically, and the airflow cannot anymore follow the blade and then it starts to stall. This has a, a effect on the static thrust. You, you hear this loud noise and sound, but you don't get more thrust.
but the speed increases. The speed of the airflow behind the propeller increases. And as you increase airspeed with the airplane, this relative angle of attack reduces and the pitch gets again traction on the air without stalling and then you have unlocked the full uh, thrust, uh, dynamic thrust and you get the high speed. And when the when the pitch essentially becomes zero, that's the top speed of the model. That's the maximum that, that the model can move. Is that is that yeah. how it works? With, in, with, with increasing airspeed, this angle of attack tends to go to zero at the maximum speed of the airplane. The, the way I'll describe this, because this sounds really weird and funky, and how the pitch is changing in with you know because it's it's relative to the the passing air that goes over it, and why at static um, you know, static thrust you have a very high angle of attack, but then as you start moving, because the air is passing over it, the actual angle of attack is effectively reduced, which means that stalling stops. But the way I would describe it is having um, an awful lot of static thrust on a model, uh, it, you can kind of think of that like first gear in a car. It's very easy to get going, but you can't, it, you can't go very fast. The other way to look at it is when you have a very high uh, pitch on your blade, that's like fifth or top gear or overdrive in your car. You can't start moving in your car in top gear, but it will allow you to reach the maximum speed. And again, those are two different, completely different things. You can't have both. You can't have a gear that allows you to pull off at the lights after they've gone to green. And you can't use that exactly that same gear to reach 150 miles an hour. That's why we have multiple gears in a car. Unfortunately, with a plane, we have one fixed pitch. So in reality, what we have to do as pilots is we have to choose a gear in between first and fifth, depending on the kind of characteristic that we want. If you want a prop hanging plane, where it's 3D and it's going to be suspended from the prop, you're going to want a lot of static thrust. So you're going to want more towards the first gear. So you might want first or second gear equivalency. And apologies for pushing this analogy a little here. The other way, if you want something that's going to go like stink, then, you know, if you want a 120 mile an hour plane, then you go for something with an extremely high pitch and accept the fact that that means that in uh, when you start off and you're, and you're launching, you might actually be in a stall condition with the prop and you're just going to have to deal with that and have a longer runway or something to, to allow it to, for the air to reattach to the top surface so you get the maximum thrust. So it's a, it's, it's a trade-off. Hopefully that explains it. Either you have high acceleration or you have a high top uh, top speed, but you cannot have both on the on one on a single gear. Uh, Fantastic, great! I, I'm I'm, ple I'm pleased you agree because sometimes <laughs> using analogies like this, you have to abstract some very complicated things, and occasionally the analogy isn't perfect. But I'm I'm pleased I'm pleased you follow it. Yeah, yeah. So so for everyone watching, hopefully that explains a little bit more. I think we've probably got time for uh, one more question that we'll do on this video, and we're going to go right to the bottom of the list that we've got here which is a really interesting one that um, Marcus and I were talking about. And it's because we just talked about the fact that changing the pitch essentially changes your top speed. Think of it like that. Uh, but also there's the change in diameter as well, because it might be that for your particular motor, and again, this is something you can test by messing around with eCalc, it might be that for some a particular motor, you might keep increasing the pitch to try and get more and more speed with a particular prop. You might actually go over the power that's available from that particular motor. And the cool thing about eCalc is it'll actually show you that um, mm -hmm. and actually warn you when you've been um, a little bit adventurous with your power system. So it'll warn you when you're pulling too much amperage for the ESC you've spec'd, when you're pulling too much power for the motor you've got spec'd. But, that's, but the, other, the other dynamic here is that as well as you've got the pitch that changes, you've also got the diameter of the prop. And those two things change the amount of amp draw from your power system and ultimately the amount of wattage that's been consumed in really different ways. And lots of people just say, well, you know, if you take an inch off the prop, you can add an extra inch of pitch. You know, I've heard those kind of ideas being talked about, but actually the relationship is slightly different. Marcus, can you talk a little bit about that, about, you know, from your experiences of, you know, changes of pitch versus changes in diameter and what that means in terms of amp draw? Changing the pitch 
has uh, a linear effect on the amperage. So when you uh, add 10% more pitch, basically your amperage will go up 10%. Increase the diameter, the power consumption will increase with power of 4. So that means when you add 10% more diameter, your amperage will go up about 40 to 45%. So that, that has a huge effect on uh, power consumption. Okay, here is an example with an 11 by 5 propeller. We drawing about 15.4 amps. Yep. So now we, we are increasing the pitch by 10% to 5.5 inch and show what's happened. So the amperage increases about uh, 1 amp. This is less than 10% due to the effect of voltage sag, and but it increases not very uh, radical. Okay. So we go now to the example when we increase the diameter by 10%, so the result's about 12 inch, mm -hmm. and now look what happened. So the Amperage okay. goes up considerable. About 3.3 .3 amps. Wow. Okay. It's it's not not dimension the 40 percent. Also due to the effect of voltage sag. With all of the things being you know caveat caveat caveat, the whole power system has to be taken into account. But you could sacrifice an inch of uh, diameter for a for a, a couple of inches of additional pitch if you wanted, and and get yeah again kind of change the gearing like we talked about on the car. That's, that's really interesting. I do like the fact that you can just plug the numbers in and just see what you're doing on stuff like this, uh, rather than having to put things on a bench and run the tests. So that was a quick four questions. Well, actually, not that quick. It took Marcus and I a little bit more to talk about it. And uh, the uh, original recording for this versus the one you've just watched uh, was an awful lot longer. I've cut it down significantly. Um, this is, as I said in the introduction, the whole stuff about motors and props is a massive topic, but this is trying to abstract a lot of these complexities into a very simple level that the majority of people watching can understand using things like the analogies. So if you are a motor and prop expert, then uh, I will appreciate that Marcus and I have not dipped in very deep into these subjects, and that is intentional. We're trying to make this uh, presentation, this video, uh, as easy to understand as we possibly can. However, saying that, I think uh, Marcus and I are interested to see the reaction to the video. Uh, and if you have any other questions, because we did have another five or six that we've got on our list, uh, and I'll give you an idea of the kind of stuff that we were going to talk about, about uh, some of the tips and tricks for converting IC and GLOW to electrical power systems. We were going to talk about, um, you know, uh, the some of the tips and tricks you can use after a flight with motor temperature to figure out whether or not you are pushing it, if you haven't already checked your setup with eCalc. Uh, there's some other things as well we we're going to talk about. If you have something you would like Marcus and I to discuss and to illustrate with some of the eCalc stuff, then do pop it down below. Uh, Marcus, I need to say a massive thank you for you putting aside the time uh, this morning to kind of run through this. I know this isn't something that you do a lot, uh, but it's just, it's great rather than me just sat here banging on about my because again i'm you know i'm a pilot with my own experiences and biases it's great to speak to somebody like you that's actually got the technical background uh and uh, to, to and, and and that's also capable like me of trying to of not dipping too far in so thank you very much for that last thing about it again the tool that we're using here is the ecalc tool uh the, the links down below on how you can sign up uh, the eCalc tool, the free version, if you don't sign up for it, uh, will not give you a full list of the props and motors. If you sign up for it, then as I'm showing here on the screen, uh, you get access to all the motors and props that are in there. All the motors and props in the world do not exist within the tool, but using it, you can absolutely test hypotheses and things you want to check out just like we've been doing in this video and it saves a lot of trial and error and potentially buying incorrect motors and props and ESCs and getting into trouble. So thank you everyone for the time. Thank you Marcus again 
And uh, like I say, if people like the video, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you want to know. And um, if there's enough interest, Marcus and I will come back and we'll carry on talking about motors and props. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for spending your time today watching that video. You can find me in all the usual places on social media. And if you're trying to learn about a subject, then check out the playlist. All of my videos are organized into easy to follow playlists that if you're trying to learn a topic, will take you from the basics right the way through to some pretty advanced stuff.